let us welcome him. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the, uh, well, I will say the reemergence of some old traditional orders of the Sikh, uh, the Sikh uh, Bant community that is emerging in the UK these, at least the past two decades, but it's really, really happening really, really fast in the past four or five years. I'm going to go through these uh, these groups and some of their activities and how they're organized, um, and also talk a little bit about the. Uh, some of the controversies they've created in the Sikh community of UK and also maybe a little bit into the future of how they might uh, develop. I'm going to talk about the Nihang Sikhs uh, of, of the UK, uh, a rel relatively small group but very, very influential. Just in the past couple of decades they've been, sorry, in the past couple of years they've been able to set up museum exhibitions, uh, conferences, academic conferences, they publish many many books on Sikh history, uh, small areas, relatively unknown areas of Sikh history, they're doing camps, they're doing weekly, uh, all actually almost on a daily basis, martial arts training, with the whole purpose of aiming or uh, reviving the, uh, the military aspects and the uh, military tradition of the Sikh community. So that's what I'm going to be talking about for the next 20-25 minutes. Basically, um, this paper, I hope some of you had the opportunity to read it, is based on uh, interviews with 25 young um, Nihangs of the UK. Um, some of them, most of them were done by in live interviews and the other ones were by email. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the profile of these Nihangs as well. And um, the, pa the purpose of the paper is to answer three questions. Who are the UK Nihangs? Why are the youngsters getting more and more attracted to this community? And what is it that they can offer which the other C groups of the UK can't uh, offer? What is it that makes them special in the eyes of their uh, own members, so to speak? This is the, this is this paper. I've been doing the research for about um, four years now, and uh, this presentation is going to be more general in the community. Um, but I've also done in-depth uh, research on the group on some of the the, the uh, rituals that they perform in, especially Shastar Puja, which is like you can translate it as weaponry worship, how do they engage and what separates them from other Sikh uh, youth of the UK. I'm going to give a few examples on, on, on some of the Shasta Puja uh, and, and the conclusions from that paper I've done. Well basically, who are the Nihans? Um, it's a military organization that traces its origins back to Guru Gobind Singh. Um, the, the Nihangs uh, have this uh, self-image that they were created with a specific order of uh, serving mankind but also protecting the Sikh faith and um, they also have uh, a clear pride so to speak when you talk to the youngsters that they are the ones possessing the true unaltered uncorrupted traditions of Guru Gobind Singh and therefore they have the right to uh, claim themselves the, the true Khalsa so to speak. Yesterday um, we're here, we heard about the problems of having any representatives of Sikhism who, who, who speaks on behalf of the Sikhs, they would say that it's them uh, being the Khalsa or being the Nihans. And uh, what we know from history is that they had a very um, prominent role in pre-colonial Punjab. Uh, they engaged in many of the war wars that took place against the Mughals, the Afghans, the Persians. Um, they were also part of the uh, Sikh empire where Maharaja Rajit Singh employed them from now and then in the, in the conquest of Afghan provinces of Kashmir, Multan, Peshawar and so forth. So they, they have a lot of history, um, which is also one of the reasons that a lot of youngsters are attracted to this community. Basically what you can say is that they differ a little bit. Um, their self-understanding, the way they look on Sikhism is very what they would call the, the Puratan form of Sikhi, the Sanatan form, like the pre-colonial form of Sikhism. This is how they see it. So a lot of the, the way that normal mainstream Sikhs see the, the religion of Sikhi, Sikhism, whatever you want to call it, is actually uh, looked down upon by these this group. They, they consider it as a form of Angriji Sikhi, uh, the British Sikhi, the Singh Sabha Sikhi, and so forth. And obviously they claim that they have the uh, 
the traditional Sikhi uh, inside their community. But basically, and this, what I'm about to say now doesn't apply to all of them, but a lot of them would say um, that this is how they see the setup of the Sikh Pant or the Sikh Khals and so forth. But there's not really a paradigm of the Amritadi and the Sajtadi like we were talking about yesterday, that you have the Sajtadis, eventually they will become the, the Amritadis. Um, that's not how they see the Sikh Pant. They have a different, uh, more holistic approach. To, uh, I'll give some examples of it. But basically they will say, again, not all of them, but many of them that I've spoken to, they will say that the Sikh or the Khalsa Pant is manifested in three forms. So you have the Satgun saints, the Rajgun householders, which is like mainstream or the, uh, the majority of the Sikhs, and then you have the Tamgun warriors. So if you look at it like linearly, on the one side you have the Sadhus, the saints, and they have a specific way of living according to the nature of their lifestyle. Um, then in the middle you have the householder, those who get married, obviously the saints, many of them don't get married because they're engaged in spiritual practices. In the middle you have the householders, um, they have a certain lifestyle, they live a certain life, and then to the, to the, in the other end you have the warriors, and they obviously have a different lifestyle as well. And as I'm writing here, according to this view, each has their own rehat <coughs> suitable to the mission they adhere to. And some of these differences in the rehat is obviously like diet, and <coughs> what nickname do you read, and so forth, based on exactly the nature of how you're, um, well, how you're living basically. This is a quote from the Sarbulu Granth, which a couple of uh, the ones I interviewed uh, brought up, a very interesting quote, uh, translated by McLeod, and it says that God has blessed the Khalsa with virtues such as those of Pagats, which is like those who engage in, in, in loving worship, of the Gyanis, those who attain wisdom, the Raj Jogis, the Kshatriya warriors. So first you have the, those, the Sadhu types, the saint types, then suddenly comes in the warriors, those who perform religious rites for others, worshippers of one God, those who engage in Bibik, and those who live apart from others, the ascetics, those who stay away from the world, and the warriors and the masters who bestride the world, obviously talking about kings. So what you see in this quote, which many of them bring forth, is that the Khalsa is not like a single guy, a single person, um, and every, all the Khalsa, whether it's in the East or in the West, they live a certain lifestyle. They say that the Khalsa is more like a group of different people with different natures, different lifestyles, um, obviously being uh, part of the Khalsa Pant. Um, so this is the way they see it. It's not about being Sajdad or Amritad, it's more about having a community where you have uh, different people who are experts in different fields, and when they all come together, that's when the when the, when the Khalsa has, has manifested or uh, emerged. There was a, I talked to um, one of their scholars in the UK and he said when all the different Jatibandis and all the different uh, groups come together, that's when the, he said, uh, that's when the Pant has come together, that's when the Pant has come together, that's when it emerges. It's not when you have the Nihangs there only, when you have the AKJ or the Taksali, so when they all come together, that's when you start seeing uh, the, the, the bond being there. So this is a very important the reason I mentioned this. It's very important to uh, to see why they see themselves, um, or sorry, why they see the bond in a certain way because they believe that they're not actually because they have a different. I'll come into the controversies, but they they they're quite controversial with some of the stuff they do with their diet, their practices. But they see it in this uh, paradigm that they live a certain lifestyle which makes them controversial that's because they have a different rehat because they consider themselves as the Tamug and Raj warriors for instance. Alright, so who are these guys? Who are the Nihams? Basically it's a recent phenomenon, it began in the late 90s um, well that's when it started kicking in, you can, know, you can trace it back to the early 90s um, but it wasn't really that successful in the beginning, just a few individuals here and there who tried to set it up it consists of some 250 to 400 individuals. This is just an estimate. Some people I've talked to uh, say that the numbers might be up to a thousand, um, depending on how you define the hunting. It is actually just a male phenomenon. Uh, it's mostly individuals in their 20s, um, and they consider themselves to be more interested in the esoteric and philosophical aspects of faith. So uh, I'll give some examples of what I mean by that later on. Um, a few women are also present in the background, not as um, independent agents, so to speak. They are more in relations to their husbands or their brothers who are Nihangs. And obviously, not obviously, but what they say their role is in, in the Nihang community is actually to prepare the coming generations of warriors 
uh, by bringing up uh, the next generation, uh, by immersing them in, 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 the, uh, in the warrior traditions, and also making room for their husbands or their brothers, by instance, by paying the bills, taking care of the house and so forth, so that their husbands have time to engage in martial arts practice and studying of Sikh scripture and so forth. So it's, this is like kind of their role, it's very traditional, uh, some would say. And like I said, it's very um, controversial in the, in the wider majority Sikh youth populace. I'll give some examples of why they're controversial and how they responded to it. So in the paper, um, I've divided the Sikh community into uh, into three groups, no, sorry, the Han community into three groups, and I'm describing three groups in, in the paper and what they do with the activities they're engaged in and how they differ from the other ones. Here in this presentation, I'll just talk about them overall. And then... Um, what you see that they're engaged in this martial arts training, Shastra as Dr. Pashoda Singh said yesterday, there's a revival uh, in the West of this Gatka training that takes place in most um, Gurdwari, but they actually look down on Gatka. They believe it to be more of an exhibitionist art where you just jump around. That's what they say, jump around, dancing around. Uh, they say it's not really uh, efficient in the battlefield. You can't kill people with this form of art. So they're teaching Shastra Vidya instead, which is more of an all around. Um, um, it's more of an all-around martial arts that they say come, goes back to, uh, to the gurus and it involves boxing, it involves use of, of swords, also guns and so forth. I'll give you some examples of it later in pictures. Um, and they train this almost on a daily basis. Uh, there's, uh, there's training taking place in London, Birmingham, Coventry, Leeds, um, Wolverhampton, Slough. And also occasionally in the US, uh, some of them from the UK, they fly to the US to do uh, occasional training here in Germany and Italy, they've trained as well. They publish, like I said, literature and websites um, on mainstream subjects such as the Golden Temple, the history of Golden Temples, but also like very niche areas such as the history of the Sikhs of Azur Tab, uh, what is their history uh, and so forth. Um, websites, obviously, they're on Facebook as well. They've organized international camps. Uh, they go to Spain, they go to, uh, sorry, they go to Southern Europe, they go to Eastern Europe, um, uh, retreats they hold, especially uh, well, in many cases with the three HO, um, and they also hold. They've also started holding conferences on a yearly basis. Museum exhibitions. They're um, helping, supporting museums around the UK uh, who have Indian uh, galleries and so forth. And they've st recently started engaging in documentaries. There was one just a couple of months ago. I don't know if you've seen it. It's on YouTube uh, called the um, the Arts of the Sea Kingdoms, the Lost Arts of the Sea Kingdoms. Um, basically, they, even though they're warriors, they're also very much into the artistic side of Sikhi, so, and they're collectors of Sikh art and rare heritage and so forth. So what they did is that, in, in co close cooperation with the C and then, sorry, with the BBC, they created a really, really good documentary where they show how the Sikhs weren't just warriors in the past, but also the, they were given patronage to artists and so forth. Very interesting, actually. Um, and this is like their main area in the future. They know that people nowadays don't read books anymore, so if you want to engage with the community, you have to do it like via popular media. So shortly, one of the groups also does annual pilgrimage trips to India during the Hulla Mahulla festivities. You can also see it on Facebook. They're quite good at putting pictures up. Some of you might have seen it. And also they're focusing heavily now on linking up with the uh, well, Sikhs, but obviously also non-Sikh institutions. One of the reasons is that they're kind of being sidelined by the majority <laughs> Sikh populace in the UK. Um, so now they kind of like found new people to uh, work with. Um, I'll give you some examples of that as well. In terms of um, scripture and social media, uh, a lot of them say that they find they, they're really fascinated by early Sikh literature. Um, and if you ask them, what do you read? Where do you get your knowledge about the Sikh warrior traditions from? They'll say the Dasam. These are the books that all, most of them mention. Um, some of them are more well read, so they mention books that normal uh, normally you won't really. Uh, know about them unless you've been digging into archives and so forth. But they all mention the Dasam Granth, the Sarablu Granth, the Rednami, the Sosaki, the Pratinpan Prakash, the Suraj Prakash Granth, and so forth, uh, which are like traditional pre colonial Sikh literature in most parts. There's a really interesting, uh, which you might want to, want to check out. Uh, it's a blog that uh, one of them is actually a Canadian thing who was created it's called seekreality.blogspot.com, where they take a lot of quotes from these before mentioned books and translate them into English for the first time. Obviously, with a bit of bias, some of the translations aren't accurate, but it's very interesting to see uh, why is it that they're choosing these 
verses from these uh, different scriptures and writings. What is it that makes them select them? Obviously, it's for ideological reason, but it also gives an imprint uh, into the ideolo ideology and the uh, mindset of these young Huns. Many of the groups have their own Facebook pages and their own websites, and uh, now they're developing a, an app on Shastar Vidya um, so that people can well, basically just on their phone they can see how do you defend yourself against the man holding a gun, the man, against the man holding a knife, how do you do this, how do you do that, so forth. Again, very much trying to see, like, uh, basically working into modern culture. Many of them are amateur collectors of ancient weaponry. As I mentioned, some of them are professional as well. Spent hundreds of thousands of pounds on, on collecting Sikh heritage. Um, and many of them practice Shastravidya, which is the martial arts, as a part of their spiritual practice. It's not something they do when they're off work and they just want to get fit and get in shape. They actually do it as a part of their nickname, as a part of their rehat. Uh, they, they see no difference between um, learning how to do boxing, for instance, and uh, doing your part, doing your nickname. That's what a lot of them say. Can you see this? This is one quote that a lot of them uh, brought up. Uh, it's uh, from the Chopa Singh Nayatnama from the early 18th century. And it basically says, first worship the Guru and then worship your weapons. This is a very important part of their ethos, this whole thing of connecting with your weaponry. Um, and they will actually say that all Sikhs are doing this. When you go to the Gurdwara and you matade, when you bow before the Guru Granth Sahib, what you do before that is that you bow to all the weapons laid out in front. So they will say in a way most people, most Sikhs are doing Shastra Puja without knowing it. In my, um, in the paper I did back in 2013 on Shastar Puja, uh, I came to realize that there was a difference between the way the British and UK Nihangs, sorry, the British Nihangs are doing their Shastar Puja, uh, sorry, their weapon worship, how they're doing it and how the ones in India are doing it. There are some clear differences here, because while the, uh, the Indian Nihangs are doing it more in the traditional way, where you use incense, you read your prayers, uh, and you cleanse your weapons, like a very typical Puja uh, you'll see anywhere in India, the ones in, in the UK, they consider the Shastarvidya, the martial arts training, as part of their worship. So for them, he's one of the guys that Shastarvidya is the same as Shastar Puja. There's no difference between worshipping weapons and using your weapon. Then he goes on, worship the wep worshiping the sword without the practical element, it just becomes a dead ritual. There's no purpose of the Puja if you can't even swing the sword in the battlefield. So they're also in a bit of conflict here with the Indian Nihangs who are very traditional and do Shasta Puja, Shasta worship as more of a traditional Indian form of Puja. Whereas these guys think that they're actually just wasting their time. Uh, roughly spoken, one of them said that because they don't know how to use the sword when, when, it's, when it comes to defending themselves. So they'd rather just spend their time doing this. Obviously a lot of Indian Nihangs get really angry about this. Um, because they think that here you have these Engreji Sikhs thinking they know our traditions. So it brings a lot of conflicts. I'll give some more examples of these conflicts later. Another one said, when he practices with the sword, battle energies arouse inside me. So sometimes I cut my arm with his sword and anoint the blood to my forehead as a pika to release the energy. So just again, they consider this as a spiritual practice, um, which elevates them spiritually when they're practicing with the sword um, and so forth. Like I said, many of them are amateur collectors of weaponry. This is one of the one of the things who showed me uh, his uh, his weapon collection. You can see his different kinds of weapons here. What they do is that when they do their Shasta Puja, they will cleanse their weapons, they will clean them, then they will sit with them, connect with the temperature of the blade, for instance, and then they will recite some prayers, most often from the Dasam Granth. Uh, the Chandi compositions there, uh, sorry, the goddess compositions from there. And then they will get up uh, and start practicing wielding the sword and so forth. This is from a house in uh, West London, uh, from one of the Hang Sikhs. And what's interesting here is that this is from his living room, uh, where he has uh, the, the Guru Granth Sahib and the Dasam Granth uh, par uh, Parkash, um, how do you say Parkash? Uh, enthroned. Um, and this is very something very unique to the Hang Sikhs in the UK. Um, and the reason they do it, is, which also makes them quite controversial, is that they believe that the Guru Granth Sahib is manifested in two, two scriptures, sometimes there's three scriptures, the Ad Granth and the Dasam Granth. 
So they say the Guru Granth Sahib alone is not what the Guru Granth Sahib alone is not the Guru. Uh, you have the Miri and the Pidi, you have the Dasam Granth and the Ad Granth. Obviously, this makes them very controversial in the eyes of the um, the mainstream Sikh populace of the UK. Many of them are now starting to get some form of uh, official recognition for their skills, for their knowledge on this uh, weaponry. This is the Imperial War Museum I went with them, um, where they're how do you say they're consulting the museum staff there on some of those weapons that they have from 19th century India, but which maybe they haven't cataloged. They don't know what it is. Then these guys comes in and tells them like the reason that the blade is curved like this is because of gives some specific purpose in the battlefield and so forth. And they're used quite a lot in museums and so forth in the UK. Again, this is the Shastra Vidya training that takes place. They use fists, they use uh, boxing, they use uh, yeah, to train with weapons as well as, as you've seen in Gaza and so forth. And what's interesting now is that they're, before in the 90s they were only training Sikhs, uh, but now they started moving on to non-Sikhs as a part of getting recognition in the wider martial arts community of the UK. So they're not really interested in this, this uh, Shastar Vidya art being preserved within the Sikh community. Now they just want it out in the open, so to speak. Um, I'll give you one example of a very, very interesting video, a very, very uh, famous video that uh, a lot of the youngsters are really proud of. Fine. Yep. All right. This is a video from a from a nun Sikh who uh, trained with the Nihangs, and this is what he said afterwards. It's a very uh, famous video. A lot of the Nihangs were very proud of showing in this video. He talks about the Shasta video afterwards. Huge, because it'll make you invincible to ordinary men. Hi, my name is Jason Peck. I'm the Western Sword Trainer here at Cold Steel. I'm a Division One nationally rated fencer in Epe, and I also do fence saber as well. Um, <laughs> The very first thing that I picked up on the Dar was his just historical knowledge, whether it be weapons, mythology, was complete for why each of these weapons is fenced and fought the way that it is. Never before have I met someone who had answers to why is this created this way? What is this indicative of on the Kukri? Uh, why, why would armor be made this way? He had all the answers that we asked for. He spent 10 years training his body and his mind. And then he went out all around India and gathered all the information he possibly could on why historically and traditionally these things exist the way they do. I have heard many times that all martial arts splintered off from a central martial art. It is my belief that this Sikh martial art, or the, the true art that is kept by the Sikhs, perhaps is a better way to say it, is the central martial art. If I just wrap up quickly. So basically, this is a video they're very proud of because they have a non-Sikh uh, person actually praising the art and their traditions. I'll just go through some other pictures where you see them uh, engaged in the UK one way or the other is a conference. So there are some challenges that also faces the Nihangs. Um, there is no clear identity. What does it actually mean to be a Nihang in the Western context? They can't roam around as nomads like the Indian Nihangs do. So what does it actually mean? I haven't really been able to get a proper... Uh, uh, thorough answer from the from the 25 people I interviewed on what how, how do you actually convert the nomadic principles and the warrior principles into a Western context. So a lot of them, they consider themselves not as warriors but as educators and transmitters uh, of these traditions, um, of the warrior traditions. It's a very heavily divided community, even though we're talking about 200, 400, it's divided into many, many subgroups. And they're con they're considered very controversial in the wider Sikh youth populace. Again, the Dasamgan, the status of the Dasamgan, a lot of them eat meat, marijuana, um, which they indulge in many of them, premarital relationship, a lot of them say that you can have sex before marriage, which obviously causes a lot of controversy amongst the other Sikhs of the UK. And also the whole role of Hinduism, are Sikhs Hindus or are they not Hindus? Um, and this causes them to be alienated, obviously, uh, but I think a lot of them, they prefer it this way. They want to be alienated from the Sikh community. 
quickly, what does the Nihang way of life offer? They offer, a, according to the ones I've interviewed, they offer an authentic tradition um, where they can actually see, all right, this is how my ancestors lived because they have access, a lot of them have access to Persian sources that describe the Sikhs, British early sources, colonial sources, and they say that the way that the British and the Persians describe the Sikhs is not the way you see Sikhs today, but the way that the Hangs are living, so obviously it gives them an authentic tradition in their worldview. An oppositional identity, a lot of them really just loves to be controversial, they love outraging people, um, <laughs> and it gives them a masculine identity as well. Uh, obviously you sit there, you engage in, in battle techniques, you study or the history of war. A lot of them, uh, they look up to all these warriors of the past who conquered some of the greatest, uh, or beat some of the greatest civilizations at the time. So obviously it gives them a lot of masculine uh, rasa, so to speak. And also tolerance, diversity and individuality. Very uh, interesting compared to what you were just talking about before. Um, some of them say that this, a lot of Sikh groups here, probably here in the West as well, they're very elitist, it's for the highly educated, but what about those who aren't highly educated? They, they, are, they don't really feel like they fit into the, uh, these other groups, whereas the Nihams are much more open and tolerant, they say. Um, and one of the leaders of this group says that, well, we take all in, it doesn't matter if they're Munni, they're Sajdaris, they're ex-criminals, it doesn't matter if they have college educations, because we're an army and we need all kinds of people. So this gives them a place and belonging as well. Shortly, just to come, sum up, um, the Nihang community of the UK is a steady but a growing community, and it's increasingly mainstreaming itself, as Dr. Peshawar Singh said yesterday as well. You see the Bana is getting more and more, uh, the, the blue dress is getting more and more uh, used by non-Nihangs. Uh, the, the Nihangs will say that this is their dress, but you also see other groups using it now. The Dasam Grant is starting to be adopted by a lot of non-Nihangs now as well. Um, a lot of traditions are being like, um, yeah, a lot of traditions are being Shastar Puja is being uh, done by other groups now as well. So it's starting to mainstream itself, and despite its low number of individuals, it is heavily overrepresented in popular Sikh and mainstream discourse and media. I've given some examples of documentaries, museum exhibitions, uh, literature, and so forth. And um, so I think, like future-wise, I think that the more they get settled, the more they get uh, organized and. Um, the more they get uh, basically experience in the field of organizational building, I think the greater a role they will play. Um, yeah, thank you very much.